my guest today says, everybody who's sick, he knows why. I think you're going to enjoy this show. Peter Glidden knew from a young age that he wanted to go into medicine. A debilitating illness and a remarkable cure led him to pursue a career in holistic health care. Dr. Glidden has run a successful naturopathic practice for over 20 years and hosts his own daily radio show. He has conducted hundreds of lectures around the world teaching that the body is able to heal itself using natural, affordable, safe, and effective solutions. An outspoken advocate for holistic health, Dr. Glidden's new book explores why MD-directed medicine consistently fails to cure disease. Here to explain his claim that everybody is sick and I know why, please welcome Dr. Peter Glidden. Dr. Glidden, welcome. It's great to have you with me. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure. That's that is a fascinating title on this book, The MD Emperor Has No Clothes. <laughs> Everybody is sick, and I know why. Man, you just say it. <laughs> yeah, we cut right to the chase because, you know, where did I hear, right? My people are destroyed by lack of knowledge. Yeah. We have a big problem here. It's a big problem. We're not getting healthier. We're getting sicker. Alzheimer's has risen from obscurity. It's the sixth leading cause of death or the fourth, depending on how you crunch the numbers. When I was a kid, autism, one out of 10,000. Now it's one out of 69. Arthritis getting worse, type 2 diabetes getting worse, life expectancy getting less. And this in the 21st century, the age of modern medicine. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on, man. We've taken the wrong dog to the hunt. Well, 30 years ago, I worked as a paramedic. And I remember getting one of my classes as we were doing, uh, I forget what it was, we were doing meds or first-line drugs for cardiac. And uh, I remember the one, one instructor saying that in the next 20 to 30 years, much of disease would be stamped out because of modern medicine. And I always remember that because now I look out there and nothing is better. It's like all these new diseases, new viruses, or at least they're naming them new names. Right. And you're right. It's like we're all kind of looking around going, what is going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. Um, we've taken the wrong dog to the hunt, right? We don't have a free medical market, and this is a problem. We have been socialized to believe through the pharmaceutical industry and the modern uh, medical society in North America that the MD owns the secret decoder ring to all things medical. <laughs> and everybody else is a back of the bus quack with substandard training. I mean, for goodness sakes, in Canada, the only medicine that your insurance pays for is MD-directed medicine. If you want a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, a homeopath, a naturopath, you got to pay out of pocket. And this is a problem. We don't have a free medical market, and we have been socialized to believe that the MD knows what's best for us, and, and for goodness sakes, they don't. Your medical doctor may be the nicest person God ever created, but your medical doctor only knows what they've been trained in, and what they've been trained in is one small piece of the medical pie. It's referred to as allopathic reductionism. But they have sold it to us for the last hundred years as the only real type of medicine. And everybody else practices alternative medicine, which is kind of like saying, right, the only <laughs> real dog is a German shepherd and every other dog is an alternative dog. <laughs> <laughs> now, talk to us about your training, uh, doctor, like what, so people have an understanding of where you're coming from. So the initials after my name are ND, stands for naturopathic doctor. And in order to become a naturopathic doctor, you have to do four years pre-med. I did that at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in Massachusetts. Then you have to do four years of naturopathic medicine. Right now in North America, there are six medical schools that practice or that teach naturopathic medicine, fully accredited medical schools that teach naturopathic medicine. So four years pre-med, four years naturopathic medical school, about 1,000 hours of clinical supervision. Then you have to pass national boards, then you have to pass state boards, then you have to do continuing education credit and get a license to practice naturopathic medicine. It's a full-blown primary care medicine, but it's in the minority, not the majority. But even though it's in the minority, <laughs> it's the most rapidly growing system of medicine in North America. Is that right? Yeah, because it works. <laughs> <laughs> Now, for people who are watching, you know, and for even the studio audience, you're right. We have been so trained 
that the doctor knows best. Go in, whatever ails you, take a pill, take a shot, and it's going to go away. And it's almost like we have, and we've gone down that path. So when someone else comes onto a television show and just starts going, bam, 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 there's kind of a bit of a, a hold back. Going, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? But you just said that it's the fastest growing one, and the Internet is filled with other ideas of health because everybody's looking. Well, you know, there is cognitive dissonance that we generate, right? Kind of like when Christ upset the, the moneylenders' tables, right? I'm, I'm sure that created a, a significant amount of cognitive dissonance, <laughs> right? So we are here to tell it like it is. We're not here to pull any punches. And we're just here to set people straight because, for goodness sakes, your medical doctor may be the nicest person that God ever created, right? But they only know what they've been trained in. And as it turns out, what they have been trained in is really good for surgery when it's necessary, okay. trauma care, right. and a handful of infectious diseases. That's the wheelhouse of the MD. So you would use a medical doctor for those three areas? Thank God for Novocaine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank God for penicillin, the surgical technique, right? I mean, this is not, we're not here to say that MDs are bad and naturopathic no. doctors are right. We're here to say, look. We need them all. We need them all. But, but we have been socialized to believe that the MD owns medicine and everybody else. They're at the top. They're at the top and they know they're the go-to person for all things medical. And they're not. A lot of my friends who go see a doctor who have also been doing things like any of the alternatives, it's a high percentage of the doctors that will look at them and just tell them, uh, what are you doing? What a waste of money. Uh, and, and, and things like that, that is just, it's a complete shutdown. That, that is ridiculous. You don't need, they might not say it in those words, yeah. but they, they bring that across to the friends of mine who have gone in and say, well, I'd like to do this. And then others are actually very excellent at it. They'll say, hey, if it's working for you, great. Uh, but the, uh, the majority, it's like there's this battle. Between well, there them. is a battle, and you know, there was, a, there was a famous physicist. He was a contemporary of Einstein. His name was Max Planck. He was the guy that discovered quantum physics, right, Max Planck, and he was kind of outspoken. And one of my favorite Max Planck quotes is, science and medicine changes uh, one funeral at a time, right? So. A uh, bunch of doctors are educated in medical school that this is the way that health is, and then they start practicing medicine, and everybody around them does the same thing, believes the same thing, and so they start thinking a particular way. When new ideas come in, it's hard for people to accept it, right? Science changes one funeral at a time. It's, li it's always been like this. The people with the new ideas, even though they're correct, it takes a generation for their information to become mainstream and as God is my witness the stuff that we're talking about today a hundred years from now will be mainstream right but we're the first people to be talking about it and because we're going against the grain so to speak mm -hmm. we do encounter you made a claim in one of your uh, I don't know the book or that it's the number one cause of death or how does that statement go is the, medical or MD in the United States the leading cause of death approximately 760,000 people a year killed by conventional medical treatments. The leading cause of death is MD-directed medical treatments. <laughs> leading cause of bankruptcy, yeah. MD-directed medical treatments. Why is this? Well, what's the most expensive medicine? It's the one that doesn't work. For goodness sakes, if you have you know, a broken leg, heaven forbid, a, bu a bullet in your arm, a third degree burn, pneumonia, the MD is the person to go to. But if you're suffering from asthma, high blood pressure, fibromyalgia, insomnia, heartburn, arthritis, the stuff that most people go to the doctor for most of the time, right. the MD can only offer you therapeutics which are not intended to cure the condition. They're only intended to manage the problem, and this is wrong. It's bad idea. They're, they're the wrong dog for the hunt. We wouldn't let a chiropractor do open heart surgery, would we? No. <laughs> you needed open heart surgery, you wouldn't go to the yeah. chiropractor. Well, if I was the Surgeon General of the world, it would be illegal, illegal for MDs to practice general medicine because they're horrible at it. And while we have let them do it, while we have given ourselves over to their tutelage, everybody is sick, 
chronic disease is getting worse, life expectancy is getting shorter. We're going over the cliff into a ditch that's on fire in the middle of a swamp, <laughs> and it's a problem. Let's take a break right here, and when we come <laughs> back, let's talk about like, let's just unpack some of the things you are seeing every day of what are you doing with this disease when it's so easy to cure from your perspective and how badly it's being managed. Just grab some of them and unpack them. I'm all in. I'll be right back with Dr. Glidden. <laughs> Welcome back. My guest today is Dr. Peter Glidden, who wrote this book, The MD Emperor Has No Clothes, and it is, the subheading is, Everybody is Sick and I Know Why. Now, we were talking in the first session just about how hard it is for you to help people. And I, I'm, I'm just going to guess, I mean, we've just met each other, but I'm going to guess that the reason you do what you do isn't because you're going to make a big fortune, it's because you care about people. Yeah, we're called, the naturopathic medicine, holistic medicine is a calling, Yeah. right? You, you do it because you're called to do it, and you get up in the morning and continue to do it, even though you get a lot of flack for it, and it's, it's very much an uphill struggle every day. Because, you know, what else is there to do? This is why I'm here. I'm not going to shut up. You're, I'm not going away. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to continue to speak the truth to whoever has ears to hear. All right. Now, you, you made some comments about uh, different stats. Let's pick a disease or a condition, whatever you want to call, whatever you want to call it, and, and what would you see as a cure as opposed to the medical establishment? Heartburn. Let's talk about heartburn. Okay. This is an interesting thing to talk about, right? And th this is a very important point for people to understand. MDs are not trained in medicine. Nobody is. Medicine is a vast territory, right? MDs are trained in one particular type of medicine, it's referred to as allopathic medicine. Okay. I'm trained in naturopathic medicine. There's chiropractic, homeopathic, osteopathic, Ayurvedic, right? Traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture. Many different types of medicine, including what the MDs are trained in, which is allopathic medicine. Now, interestingly, allopathic medicine is based on a philosophy called reductionism. Every other type of medicine is based on a philosophy called holism. Reductionism argues if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Ah. So since nobody's ever dissected the soul out of a human being, since nobody's seen it with an MRI or a CT scan, it doesn't exist. Right. To the allopathically trained MD, consciousness itself is a function of biochemistry. And once you die, it's lights out, game over. There's no such thing as a soul, no such thing as a spirit, no such thing as life after death. It's all a fiction. And most importantly, allopathic reductionism argues that the human body is a bag of biochemicals waiting to break. And when it does break, it is not the doctor's job to cure the condition. It's the doctor's job to manage the symptoms with drugs or surgery. A cure is not possible. A cure is not even attempted. Think about it. Of the thousands of prescription medications that are currently available, the only meds that cure anything are antibiotics. Let's talk about heartburn. Well, to underline one other point, holistic physicians argue mm -hmm. that the body is endowed with a spiritual soul force, which brings intelligence to play, divine intelligence. Our bodies are smart. Our bodies are so smart, they grew themselves all by themselves from a tiny organism into us. Now, if it, the body can do that, do you think it can fix itself? Well, every holistic uh, discipline in the world argues yes, the MDs argue no. Hmm. So it's the holistic physician's solemn duty to provide therapeutics which support the body's built-in God-given ability to fix itself. It's the MDs sworn duty to suppress and manage symptoms. Now let's talk about heartburn. Okay. okay. You have heartburn, the MD will tell you that it's caused by too much stomach acid, mm -hmm. but they won't tell you how it's possible that the human body produce too much stomach acid. They'll just tell you it's a superabundance of stomach acid and you need a proton pump inhibitor which completely obliterates your body's ability to produce hydrochloric acid or you need an antacid, right? By the way, the largest selling drug in the world right now, proton pump inhibitors and antacids. 
Really? Everybody is taking a proton pump inhibitor or an antacid. And the MDs have convinced us that the reason that we have heartburn, GERD, esophageal reflux, or Barrett's esophagus, right, whatever it is, is because one morning the human body just woke up and decided to produce too much stomach acid. <laughs> okay? okay? And you have to not cure the condition, because we don't know what causes it. You have to manage it with daily proton pump inhibitors. Pretty good for the pharmaceutical industry, not so good for us, right? It's symptom management, not a cure. Now, inquiring minds want to know, why on earth would we give nearly a trillion dollars, which is what we did, trillion, that's a thousand billion dollars of research money to come up with a cure for cancer to the medical profession that does not even know how to cure heartburn. <laughs> Uh, well said. <laughs> because, right, we've been socialized to believe that the MDs own the secret decoder ring to all things medical and everybody else is a back of the bus quack. We are of the opinion that heartburn is not caused by too much stomach acid, it's caused by not enough stomach acid. It's very easy for the body to run out of things and to underproduce. It's very difficult for the body to have a superabundance of things and overproduce. So, here's what happens. You swallow food, it goes into your stomach, it squishes out the walls of the stomach. Pressure receptors squirt a, a, a digestive enzyme called gastrin into the stomach. Gastrin builds up, and when gastrin gets to a certain level, the body then secretes hydrochloric acid. When hydrochloric acid and gastrin mix together, you have digestive soup, and life is good, the food that you just swallowed gets digested chemically and everybody's happy. However, if you do not have enough hydrochloric acid, you swallow food, the pressure receptors are stimulated, gastrin gets secreted, more gastrin, more gastrin, more gastrin, no hydrochloric acid. More gastrin, more gastrin, more gastrin, no hydrochloric acid. More gastrin, more gastrin, no hydrochloric acid because the feedback mechanism is gone. Gastrin has a peculiar property. When too much gastrin is in the stomach, there's a little valve at the top of the stomach that should be closed, it opens up. And now the gastrin, which is acidic, squirts into your throat and causes heartburn. Why is there too much gastrin? Because there's not enough hydrochloric acid. Why is there not enough hydrochloric acid? because you are deficient in salt and calcium. Salt kills you. Salt, <laughs> your body loves salt. The MDs yep. have told you that salt kills that's right. you, and that's why everybody has heartburn. <laughs> so you just give them salt? Well, what we tell people to do is what's correct biochemically and which is in step with human anatomy and physiology. Your body needs salt. Salt is an extremely important nutrient for the human body. Can you do too much of it? Yes. Too much water will kill you. Too much sunlight will kill you. Yeah. You can do too much of anything. It's hard to do it, though. It's hard to do too much salt, mm -hmm. honestly. Salt and calcium. This is our fundamental message here, that, the, that all chronic diseases, every single one, are directly related to nutrient deficiencies. Deficiencies. There's no more food in our food. Everybody is nutritionally deficient. Everybody. Number one. Number two, in addition to that, everybody is eating food, the wrong food all of the time. We're eating food that's hurting the body, and the body is completely undernutrified. When you put these two things together, everybody gets sick, and then you get sick. You're in pain, you're in trouble, you got to go to a medical doctor and they deliver therapies that don't cure it. They manage it. <laughs> and I'm the quack. <laughs> you basically are saying the body will heal itself if it's given the right conditions. Yes, this is the fundamental philosophy that naturopathic medicine, quite frankly, homeopathic medicine, herbalism, Ayurveda, uh, chiropractic, every holistic type of medicine argues the human body is endowed with a spiritual force, a spiritual intelligence, a divine intelligence. 
which is directing the show. There are millions of metabolic processes happening right now in our bodies completely beyond our conscious control. Somebody's running that show. It's the divine intelligence in the human body that's running that show. The body knows how to fix itself. The body wants to fix itself. But it needs raw materials to do it. This is our fundamental point. The body needs 90 essential nutrients, 9-0, 60, 90. 90, 60 minerals, like calcium and sulfur and zinc and magnesium, 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, 12 amino acids, and two essential fatty acids, a grand total of 90. This has to go down the hatch every day in order for the body to have the stuff it needs to function the way that nature and God yeah, intended. There's no it. way you can find 90 almost anywhere around, though. Well, but this is interesting, right? If the 90 essential nutrients are not present in the food, not all of them. And modern agricultural methods, through the overuse of pesticides, destroys not only the bugs that eat the plants, but it also destroys the bacteria that's in the soil that helps the plant suck up the nutrients into the plant body. So, <laughs> if this is how much nutrition your body needs in order to just work the way that God intended it to, this is how much is in, was in food maybe when you were a kid, now this much is in food. Now you walk through life, experience the stress of life, emotional stress, financial stress, political stress, environmental stress, viruses and bacteria and lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. <laughs> Your body burns through the rest of its reserves. Now you're running on fumes and things start to break. So you run out of omega-3 essential fatty acids, you get asthma. You run out of calcium, you get uh, uh, heartburn, you get muscle tics or twitches or bad menstrual cramps, chronic low back pain, arthritic conditions, high blood pressure. There are over 370 illnesses directly related to a deficiency in calcium right? Whoa. Over 370. So you run out of the essential nutrients your body needs, then something breaks. So you go to the only medicine that your insurance pays for, which is allopathic MD directed medicine. The doctors don't know anything about medical nutrition. They don't believe that the body can cure itself. So they give you a drug that manages the problem. The drug in its working in the human body also burns through nutrients. So after six months or a year, the drug stops working or they need to increase its potency or they need to give you a second or a third drug. And then you get worse and then you need another drug and then it gets worse and then you need surgery. And then you get a secondary infection from the surgery and then you need another drug for that and then you die. And then your relatives are so grief stricken that they organize a 5K run on your behalf to come up with a cure for stomach cancer. And who do they give the money to? the people that failed you in the first place. This is a problem. We do not have a free medical market, and we're wow. dying because of it. I mean, people are intelligent, but <laughs> you'd think that they'd be allowed to go study it for themselves, but a lot of people want someone just to look after them. Have well, you found that? They just, I want to go see my doctor and whatever he says I'm going to do, and they're not going to read for themselves? Or... Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, I mean, let's talk about it, right? Let's talk about it. Life is hard, man. Yeah. We got jobs, we got kids, we got mortgages, we got car payments, we got stuff we got to do, man. And you know, if you're doing, if you're an insurance guy or you're a lawyer or you're a plumber or you're a carpenter or you work on an oil rig in Alberta, you've got a particular skill set and this is what you're good at. This is what you learn, this is what you focus. You don't have time to figure out all this medical stuff. You trust that the doctor knows what's best and this is the problem. Your medical doctor may be the nicest person that God ever created, but they only know what they've been trained in. They don't know what's best for you. They know one tiny piece of the pie of medical science, and that's it. And all their colleagues do, too. And then when somebody alternative comes along, they slam them. They kick them off of the bus, right? They're alternative, back of the bus, quackery. It's nonsense. If we had a free medical market, if all of a sudden, right, by some genie in the bottle magic, we woke okay. up tomorrow, okay. there were just as many naturopaths as MDs, just as many naturopathic hospitals, just, and it was all covered by insurance, and the naturopaths and the homeopaths and the Ayurvedic practitioners and everybody else got half of the research money that the pharmaceutical industry does. If that happened within three years, MDs practicing general family medicine would be out of a job. 
because their therapeutics for chronic diseases do not work. And in a free market, people gravitate towards what works. What works. They'd be out of a job because our therapeutics work. And, and don't get me wrong, thank God for Novocaine. Yeah. <laughs> thank God for penicillin. Sure. Surgery right? for important. That's right, when you need it. Mm -hmm. But when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. So in point of fact, whether you really do need surgery or not, the surgeon most probably is going to tell you you need surgery because that's all that they know. Very good. Let's take a break right here. When we come back, I'd like to unpack again just some of the things you're seeing out there with certain diseases. We were talking about heartburn on another show, and it was just kind of shocking yeah. to see your progression of what the problem is. So a lot of people are just looking at symptoms, and they're not getting to the root of the, the problem. Bingo. So we'll be right back with Dr. Peter Glidden. If all of these illnesses were in fact genetic, why aren't there less and less and not more and more? Welcome back. My guest today is Dr. Peter Glidden, who wrote this book, The MD Emperor Has No Clothes. <laughs> that is funny. Now, everyone has been listening to, to you as you're sharing that there's more, we're not saying that, that kick every MD out of the country because there's things that you have seen them yourself about. But we, you really want, as I'm listening to you talk now, you really want people to be able to research and see all the other options yeah. that are out there. Yeah. Now, give me an example again. I'd love to grab another one. You're saying, okay, they're, treat, they're, they're, they're just managing the problem. They're just treating symptoms, uh, but they're not getting people cured. What's another one that you would look at that you see all the time? Type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is rapidly rising. It's everywhere all the time. It's getting worse and worse. What do you mean worse. it's rapidly rising? More and more and more people are getting type so 2 diabetes. So they're not curing it at all? I, I mean, for goodness sakes. <laughs> I mean, let's, you know, let's call a spade a spade. Okay. Arthritis, can't cure it. I mean, you want to have a, 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 a eureka moment? Mm -hmm. Do a Wikipedia search. Just pick a disease. <laughs> Do a Wikipedia search and look to see what the cause of the disease is. We don't know what the cause of the disease. Medical doctors don't know what causes anything. It's supposed to be genetic. Well, I don't think so. Because didn't Darwin argue about the survival of the fittest and, you know, the selection, yep. natural selection? So if all of these illnesses were, in fact, genetic, why aren't there less and less and not more and more? Because they're not genetic. It has nothing to do with it. If there's anything to do with the chromosomal activity and the relationship to chronic disease, it's because of epigenetics, environmental factors which negatively affect the genes. Something that's genetic, you're born with it. So the pancreas is not producing enough insulin. Is that what's going well, on? Well, okay. So there's two types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, okay. where your pancreas stops producing insulin. Okay. Then you need insulin to live. And type 2 diabetes, which you develop later on in life, where your body starts to get sluggish in its ability to metabolize sugar. Right? Mm -hmm. Type 2 diabetes is rising rapidly. Now, interestingly enough, the medical doctors have no idea what causes it, and they have no idea how to cure it. They manage it with metformin and with um, insulin. Uh, metformin reduces the liver's ability to metabolize sugar. Uh, so let me walk you through how this happens, okay? So you eat something that has sugar in it. By the way, sugar <laughs> is not the antichrist. Okay. Sugar is the gasoline of the body. You couldn't blink an eyelash without sugar. Sugar is so important to the human body that your DNA is made from it. DNA is an acronym, deoxyribonucleic acid. The ribo stands for ribose, which is sugar. sugar. Your DNA is made from sugar. You couldn't blink an eyelash without it. The problem isn't sugar. It's how much are you eating and how efficient is your body at dealing with it. So, eat something that's got sugar in it. Your body produces uh, insulin. Insulin floats through the blood, binds to the cell walls. How does it know how to do that? You would think that would be an interesting question to ask, but medical doctors don't ask that question. How does it know what to do? It's a biochemical. How does it know where to go and what to do? Well, I'll tell you how it knows where to go and what to do, because there's divine intelligence guiding it, period. So, insulin floats through the blood, binds to a cell wall. There's a little receptor on the cell wall that's specific just for insulin. Insulin binds to that receptor, 
sends an electrical signal through the middle of the cell to open up a door on the other side of the cell to let the sugar in. It's like some, somebody showing up at your house, ringing the front doorbell, and the kitchen door opens up to let the groceries in. All right? That's how it should happen if you're healthy. Okay. But in order for that signal to go through and open up the sugar door, minerals need to be present inside the cell. So we're back to minerals. It's a big deal, man. Two minerals specifically, vanadium and chromium, but there's about 25 other minerals that are at play also. So if this is how, much, how many minerals your body needs, but this is how many are in the body because they're not in the food like they used to be, then the insulin binds to the cell wall, tries to send a signal to open up the sugar door, but it gets interrupted. The sugar door stays closed. So what does the body do? It produces more insulin because the sugar is outside the cell, not inside the cell. The body knows that. How does it know that? Nobody knows how it knows that, but it knows that. <laughs> so sugar is still in the cell. The body produces more insulin, more insulin, more insulin. It rings the bell. The door is closed. It rings the bell. The door is closed. More insulin, more insulin. Finally, there's so much flipping insulin in the blood that it forces its way through the door. It slams through the door, breaks the door open. A little bit of sugar gets in the cell. Is that a good idea? It's a bad idea because you break the door when that happens. What happens when you break enough of those doors? Your fingers fall off, your toes fall off, your feet fall off. You get diabetic neuropathy, you get gangrene, all of which are associated from blood sugar issues, but not blood sugar issues, too much insulin. What does the MD deliver? Insulin to somebody who's type 2 diabetic. And their other strategy is to give a drug called metformin which inhibits the liver's ability to produce sugar. Well, this is fascinating, <laughs> right? Yeah, let's do that <laughs> instead of just giving minerals, which, by the way, in 1957, okay. it was proven by a medical doctor that vanadium and chromium specifically was related to type 2 diabetes. This guy named Mertz, Dr. Mertz, could turn type 2 diabetes on or off in laboratory mice by giving or withholding chromium. That was in 1957. Well, why haven't we heard about it? Why isn't it out there mainstream helping people? Because a, a medical doctor, the pharmaceutical industry, makes more money managing the disease than they do in curing it. Interesting. My people are destroyed by lack of knowledge. So if you were seeing someone right now with type 2 diabetes, what would you do for them? You give them minerals. <laughs> Bob's your uncle. Boom. You give them the 90 essential nutrients. And this is the holistic method, okay? The holistic method is the body knows how to fix itself. The body wants to fix itself. The body's trying to fix itself, but the body needs help. We need to eat food. We need to breathe air. We need to drink water. Well, there's one more thing we need to do that nobody told us. I'm telling you right now. You need to swallow 90 essential nutrients every single day. You need to do that. Appropriate for your body weight. In recipes that your body can actually absorb. When you do that, your body fixes it, takes care of it. Now, how much is your body going to be able to fix it? Depends on how bad it was before you started doing the program. You wouldn't believe the things I've seen people recover from. You wouldn't believe it. The wow. body's ability to cure itself is much greater than anybody has led you to believe. We must mineralize the body. We must nutrify the body. And then we also have to stop eating certain foods that are gumming up the works. Wow. When we do these two things, the body rallies and healing begins. Our time is up. This is fascinating. I mean, the other day I was listening to a doctor, one of the top doctors on television, an MD, say, basically say that, you know, all these people taking all these supplements and all these vitamins, he said, what a waste of money. He said, it's just going in one end and going out the other end. Just eat good. You're saying there's not enough in our food to even eat good. You've got to supplement. This is academic. This is not arguable. It's just wrong, incorrect, yep. bad information. I mean, when you drink beer, you pee it out, <laughs> but it makes quite an effect as it's passing through, right? Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> Duh. You know, we live in a world where most of us rely on experts. Right. Life's become complex. I mean, I don't know how to fly a plane, so I trust somebody to take me. I don't know where they're going when I get above the clouds. <laughs> so I'm trusting that pilot to get me at the city I want to get to. And what I'm hearing you say in some of our other uh, programs is that 
the medical doctors, as far as you're concerned, have kind of dropped the ball at healing people. They're just managing symptoms, and that there is a number of other alternatives out there that are doing an amazing job. But I know for myself, um, I don't know what to believe sometimes because when you get on the internet and Google some stuff, you got all these amazing things and then you got people who are completely against it. This person says, they're amazing. This person says, they're a quack. Like, there's so many mixed messages. Well, thank God for science, right? Thank God yes. for education. Thank God for a little bit of regulation, right? I mean, if your son or daughter wanted to learn how to play hockey and you had the choice, for exactly the same amount of money, right, mm -hmm. of having Jonathan Taves from the Chicago Blackhawks, right, or your high school hockey coach <laughs> teach them how to play hockey, you're probably going to go with the professional. Right, the right. results. That's right. So if you're up against a health condition and you're frustrated with whatever it is that you're doing, which is probably MD-directed medicine, You've tried them over and over and over and over and they've failed you and they've failed you and your health has gotten worse and you don't know what to do but you know you want to do something. Then it would perhaps be prudent for you to lean on a professional who's trained, regulated, licensed and experienced in the alternative quote unquote method. Now the problem with this situation is there are less than 4,000 licensed naturopathic physicians in the entire world. And of those 4,000, there are less than 300 that have more than 25 years of clinical experience. We've been led down uh, the goose path in two ways here. We're suffering from two cultural myths. Number one, that the MD owns the secret decoder ring to all things medical and everybody else is the back of the bus quack. It's a lie. And number two, interestingly enough, healing is a complicated, sophisticated process. It can only happen in high-tech, multi-million dollar hospitals. That's not true. Surgery is complicated. And if you, if you had the choice of doing surgery in a multi-million dollar high-tech facility or a mash tent, you're going to want to use the high-tech facility. But healing is easy. Surgery is complicated. Healing is easy. The body knows how to fix itself. You just need to educate yourself about what the body needs, what the body doesn't need, start to apply it, and see for yourself what works. So, like, if someone comes to you, so let's pretend, okay, you're the doctor here and I've got a problem. I'm going, okay, so they say I've got high blood pressure and they want to put me on high blood pressure meds. What would you say? Well, I would say that when you hear hoofbeats, you think about horses before you think about zebras. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. So when you see a diagnostic condition, you think about the most common things that cause it before you start thinking about esoteric arcane things. Mm -hmm. The single most common cause of high blood pressure is a deficiency in the mineral magnesium. Really? Yeah. It's interesting how that works, right? You have two types of blood vessels in the human body. You have arteries and you have veins. And arteries carry blood away from the heart, veins carry blood back to the heart. Well, what's the difference? Well, there's one significant difference between the two. Arteries have muscles, veins do not. Well, why does an artery have muscle? Because God is smart. So when the heart pumps blood out of the heart, it goes into the artery, and the muscle in the artery constricts and relaxes in order to help the heart pump the blood. Fascinating mechanism, like a snake crawling down the street. The artery constricts and relaxes, constricts and relaxes in order to help the heart pump the blood. That's fantastic. Well, how does the muscle constrict and relax? The same way that a, a, a bicep constricts and relaxes, or any muscle in the body, it's done through magnesium and calcium. If you do not have enough magnesium, the muscle will constrict, but it cannot relax. So it stays constricted. Now, if you have a garden hose and there's water coming out of it, and you squeeze the hose just a little bit, the water comes out faster, right? Mm -hmm. It's because you've decreased the volume, the pressure goes up. So when the artery gets collapsed because of not enough magnesium, the blood pressure spikes. So you don't have high blood pressure because you have a circulatory system. You don't have high blood pressure because you have a bad gene. You don't have high blood pressure because you're getting older or because you have a voodoo curse. <laughs> you have high blood pressure because your body ran out of the stuff it needed to maintain proper blood pressure, period. Do some drugs that you take strip 
the oh. stuff out of your body? Well, <clears throat> remember, from our point of view, it's not the drug, it's how it's used, right? I can prescribe drugs. Thank God for Novocaine. Every time I'm in the dentist's office, I thank God <laughs> right. for Novocaine. But here's what people don't, we just haven't thought it through. So when you take a drug into the body, it upregulates your biochemistry. How does it do that? Well, it turns certain things on and makes certain things work faster and more better. How does it, what are the mechanisms that the drug regulates, made from? Vitamins, minerals, amino acids, essential fatty acids. That's the stuff that your body is made out of. So when your metabolism is messed with by a drug, it burns through your nutrient reserves that much faster. That's how the drug works, which is why you'll get a blood pressure medication, for instance, and it works for six months, and then you need to increase the dose. So why did you need to increase the dose? Because the drug stripped your body of, the nut of more nutrients. Now, if I was a pharmaceutical, you think the pharmaceutical industry doesn't know how drugs work? You think they don't know the relationship between vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and, and the mechanism of action of a pharmaceutical? They know. Why don't they put vitamins, minerals, amino acids in with the drug? Because if they did, they'd have to sell less drugs because they'd work more efficiently. <laughs> but more to the point, okay. the drug itself is not addressing the root cause of the problem. It's like you've got water leakage in the basement, and now you have mold. All right, so you go into the basement and you paint over the mold with paint. Well, you don't see the mold anymore, you don't smell the mold anymore. It's still there because you didn't fix the leak. Right. It's only a matter of time until there's more mold. This is what drugs do, except, you know, a handful of antibiotics. They don't address the root cause of the issue. They simply sweep things under the rug, suppress and manage symptoms, which ultimately get worse. Your health gets worse, more drugs. Your health gets worse, surgery. Your health gets worse, more drugs, and then you die. So you're saying that also new problems rise up? Yes, yes, because, because this is, the again, the, the holistic method, right? Everything in the body is connected. So if you, in this case, don't have enough magnesium, not only is it going to affect your blood pressure, but it's going to affect every other metabolic pathway in the body that demands magnesium. It is a complicated, complex situation. So we do not try to micromanage or uh, figure out exactly what nutrients that are deficient in anybody's body at any moment in time. We trust in the wisdom of the body. So our recommendation is foundation fundamental boilerplate medical nutrition. Everybody needs to take 90 essential nutrients every day into their body, appropriate for their body weight, in recipes that you can actually absorb, and then let the body sort it out. It'll pick what it wants, what it needs. And, and get rid of the rest. We're going to take a break right here. When we come back, I want to unpack some more of this. My guest today is Dr. Peter Glidden. We'll be right back. We are of the belief that the antibody is the result of the disease, not the cause of the disease. Welcome back. My guest today is Dr. Peter Glidden. We've been joking around with, with the studio audience a little bit, and they want to know about what? Autoimmune, Autoimmune. disease. Where do you start with that? Holy smokes. Well, <laughs> the philosophy of medicine that the MD is trained in is a very particular worldview. It's called allopathic reductionism. And it looks at the world through a certain filter, right? Their interpretation of data is flawed. It has a built-in a priori prejudice that we believe is present that they don't, they're not aware of. So for instance, if I went outside every day and I measured the position of the sun in the sky, and I charted it, and I took thousands of calculations, had thousands of data points over the course of a year. I could accurately predict where the sun was going to be in the sky at any moment in time in the future, and I'd be absolutely correct. If I did not know about gravity or the mass of the Earth or the mass of the sun, if I didn't know that and I had all this data, I could reasonably conclude and be supported by mountains of data that the sun moves around the earth. Well, look, your sun moves. 
It's the sun that moves, it's not the earth, and I've got the data to, to prove it and back it up. Because you were missing a few data points, you would be wrong, even though you thought in your bones you were absolutely correct. That's the way that it is with autoimmune disease. Hmm. The medical doctors look at somebody who has an autoimmune disease. Let's say it's rheumatoid arthritis, right? Okay. And they draw their blood, and they look in the blood, and they see that there's an antibody there that isn't present in the body of someone who's healthy. And then they see another rheumatoid arthritis patient, same antibody, same antibody, same antibody, same antibody, same antibody. Then they conclude that the antibody is causing the disease. We are of the belief that the antibody is the result of the disease, not the cause of the disease. Here's how much nutrition your body needs. Here's how much is in your food, less than half. The stress of life burns through your reserves, and then things start to break. So your joints start to break because the body doesn't have the raw materials that it needs to keep them healthy. So every day when you move around, there's little bits of inflammation, little bits of inflammation on a cellular level, little bits of inflammation, little bits of inflammation. And in addition, you are unwittingly eating food every day that you think is healthy, that's producing inflammation. It's like throwing gasoline on an existing fire. So inflammation, 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 dead tissue, dead tissue, dead tissue, dead tissue, dead tissue. What does the body try to do to dead tissue? Get rid of it. Yeah. Right? You see a dead animal on the road, you turn it over, it's being eaten by worms, right? Mm -hmm. So the body develops an antibody to eliminate the dead and diseased tissue. Is if the MD looks and says, oh, the antibody is there, it wasn't present in a healthy person, it's present in someone with rheumatoid arthritis, therefore the antibody is causing the disease, therefore our treatment is going to be suppress the immune system. How does that work? Poorly. So what do we do in someone who has any type of autoimmune disease? Well, we counsel people to stop eating food that's causing inflammation. <laughs> Give me the top ten, what would All they right? be? Oh my God, this is, well, shake, bad, my, bad, bad, shake bad. my hand because this is, now you're going to stop liking me now. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wheat, barley, rye, and oats. That's the top four, okay. Really, you, wheat, barley, rye, and oats, okay. What do we eat all the time? Gluten. Wheat, barley, rye, and oats, gluten. Wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Oil in a bottle. All oil? Olive oil. Canola oil. Stop it. Coconut oil. If it's oil in a bottle, it's going to hurt you. Fried food. Okay. I don't even want you to be downwind of fried food. Fried food causes cancer. It creates a chemical in the body called acrylamide. It causes cancer. It's bad. You should not eat anything that's fried. That includes stir-fried organic vegetables cooked in extra super-duper virgin olive oil. Stop it. Uh, no frying, all oil gone. Correct. Okay. What are you cooking? Uh, butter or lard. And, the ones they say are the worst. And salt. And lots of salt. Okay. Okay. Red meat that's cooked well done. If you're going to eat red meat, go for it. Just make sure it's rare or medium rare. Well done red meat has a protein called a heterocyclic amine, which causes cancer. It's bad. Meat with nitrates added as preservatives. Which is sausages. Deli ham, deli mm. sausage, pepperoni, turkey, bacon. You can find all that stuff without nitrates. You can. Okay. You can, yeah. Nitrates turn into a, a chemical called nitrosamine, which causes cancer. It's a bad idea. Okay. The skins of baked potatoes, yams, and sweet potatoes. Okay, the skins of baked potatoes, yams. You know when they get crunchy, yeah. the skins? they taste so good. Yeah, yeah, they're going to kill you. Why? <laughs> because the protein in the skin under high heat like that has turned into a chemical called a heterocyclic amine, which causes cancer. So if you're going to eat a baked potato, eat the potato, not the skin. Not the skin. Or better, boil the potato or crock pot it then you can eat the skin and the potato. The next is a carbonated beverage during a meal. During a meal? Yeah. Everybody and, drinks pop during a meal. Yeah, I know. It's bad. So the, why? The bubble. I don't care if it's Perrier. I don't care if it's champagne. I don't care if it's beer. I went off I don't pop care if and I went club to Perrier. Soda. There you go. So that's, some, that's wrong, too. The bubbles, <laughs> the bubbles are carbon dioxide. Right. <clears throat> carbon dioxide neutralizes stomach acid. If you're healthy, your stomach acid is extremely strong. It's extremely acidic. It's supposed to be. So you eat food, right? This is how much nutrition you need. This is how much nutrition is in the food. You swallow it and you wash it down with something with bubbles. You've just neutralized your stomach acid. 
So now the body can't digest anything out of the food. You're basically getting useless calories. Now, if you want to drink Perrier, between meals, not during a meal. Okay, and the last two foods, corn and soy. All corn. What about popcorn? Um, unless it is, you are guaranteed, and you have, you are guaranteed, you've been guaranteed, it's not genetically modified, and it's organic. Because genetically modified corn and soy is directly related, not indirectly, directly related to three types of cancer, deaths from um, high blood pressure and deaths from stroke. Genetically modified soy and corn. So we must start going organic, and you must attempt, if you're going to eat corn or soy and probably everything else, ungenetically modified. So think this through with me, okay? Right? Here's how much nutrition the human body needs, 90 essential nutrients. Here's how much is in the food, less than half. The stress of life burns through your reserves. And then on top of that, you're eating food all of the time, which causes inflammation and disallows nutrients from being absorbed into the bloodstream. That's what gluten does, by the way. If you eat gluten, it damages in most people. It damages the um, structure in the intestine that absorbs nutrients. So you eat gluten, it's hard for your body to absorb nutrients because the tissue that absorbs nutrients is damaged by the gluten. So here's how much nutrition you need. Here's how much is in your food. Uh, the stress of life burns through your reserves, and then you eat food that causes inflammation and that disallows absorption of nutrients into the body. Okay, Everybody so, gets sick. So there are people, and I know a lot of them, who when they eat gluten, they're tired, they're bloated, they feel gross. And then there are people who seem to have no symptoms at all and eat it freely. Yeah, are then, you and saying, then when they're 30 years old, they get arthritis. So they, it is affecting them. They're not free from it. Yeah, and there's a process in, in physiology called habituation where you get used to a negative stimulus, mm -hmm. right? I remember in college you could smoke in bars, right, back in the day. I was never a smoker, but we'd go and we'd watch a hockey game. You know, you're in there for two and a half, three hours. You're surrounded by cigarette smoke. You don't smell it anymore. And then at halftime or during the period break, you go out to your car to get something. It, you come back in. As soon as you open the door to the bar, it's like, oh, my God, is it smoky in here? You habituate to a constant negative stimuli. You, you forget that it's there. So take the Dr. Glidden challenge, okay? Four, four weeks in a row. Okay. Go completely gluten-free, okay. 100%. Don't even look at it. No wheat, no barley, no rye, no oats. You can have gluten-free bread, gluten-free cookers, gluten-free crackers, gluten-free pancakes, gluten-free whatever you want for four weeks. Stop it. And then on the 29th day, just eat gluten. Okay? Have pancakes for breakfast, have a bagel for lunch, have pasta for dinner, have cookies and crackers and donuts all day long. Wait 24 hours and see how you feel. How am I going to feel? Like crap. <laughs> <laughs> proof of the pudding so in the eating, right? Prove it to yourself. Right? Yeah, prove it to prove yourself. It to and this is an interesting thing to talk about. This is the only reason that my profession survives in such a hostile political climate, right? It is. It's stacked against us. It is. It is, it right? Is. And... We continue to exist. Not only do we exist, we continue to thrive. We continue to get more popular, more accepted. And how is this possible? Because the proof of the pudding is in the eating. When you give your body the stuff it needs to fix itself, you stop eating food that's coming up the works, your body rallies and fixes itself. It's kind of like we've been driving around in an automobile for 30, 40, 50 years. It's never been tuned up. And every time we put 10 gallons of gas in it, we put one gallon of uh, diesel fuel. Well, that's the wrong fuel for the car. It's only a matter of time until yeah. something happens. So when you finally get enlightened, so to speak, and you do the right stuff, you give the body what it needs, stop eating the crap, all of a sudden it's like you're driving around in a car that's tuned up. Your sleep's better, your energy's better, your mood's better, your, uh, everything's better. Because your body now, for the first time since you've been born, has everything that it needs to work the way that nature and God intends it to. And that's a game changer. Wow. Thank you for being with us today.
and appreciated having you here. My guest today has been Dr. Peter Glidden. The book, The MD Emperor Has No Clothes. Uh, read a copy. I think it's important for all of us to study for ourselves what's going on out there. You're going to find a lot of opinions like Dr. Glidden's, but you're going to have to make some decisions about your health. So go learn, go grow, and be informed. We'll be right back. <laughs>